This episode is brought to you by Avalanche, the layer one that is blazingly fast, low cost, and eco-friendly. You'll hear more about Avalanche later in the show. <laughs> you have this like weird love for like a very few specific things. It's like, Harry, I, oh man, it's it's your punk. It's Harry Potter. <laughs> like a very few amount of things, but I feel like you go all in I'm, on like I'm three a simple man. I, I like I like crypto. I like coffee. I like Harry Potter. Yeah. I like Legos. Like you know, there's other things I like, but you know, yeah. How you doing, sir? Well, doing all right. You know, it's sort of like uh, I don't know. I, I I was really excited about this week. I think there was a lot of hype, and 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 then it was just like it was like lackluster. I don't know. I don't, I don't know what I feel. I I I maybe it's sort of I've grown numb to volatility, or just this a lot of thinking mindshare going into macro, and I don't know. I don't know. How, how are you feeling? <laughs> That was the most depressing. That was the most depressing. How you doing? I've heard you ever say, which might be the most indicative thing of a bear market that I've ever heard, is the tone in Santi's voice. <laughs> I know. I know. I have. A, I know. I have bear sweater. I like bear sweaters. It does not mean we're in a bear market. And maybe I. I guess since I started candidly wearing bear sweaters, market has been down like now thirty percent or so. But you know, I, I'm very excited. There's a lot to talk about. Um, but before I there go is. there, before we go there, how are you doing? Uh, I'm doing well. I'm doing well. It's It's been a good week. It's been kind of an exhausting week. So I'm at this, I'm in week number two, uh, out of this four week trip with Mike, we're bunkered down, uh, at a house in kind of the middle of, uh, America and it's sunny out here and we're golfing and playing tennis and hiking and things like that. Uh, but we're also just cranking, right? We're starting work at like you know, five thirty, six a.m. I will admit, Mike usually beats me to the desk by like ten minutes, which he uh, continues to remind me throughout the day. Um, but that does mean that he makes the coffee, so that's a good thing. Uh, but we had we had three new people start this week. Um, really exciting. We've got a couple new people, a couple job offers, a couple folks signed this week as well who start in a couple of weeks. So we just hit. Uh, but big news for you, sir. We just hit forty people full time at Blockworks now. Who's talking about? I mean, that doesn't scream like a bear market to me, if you ask me. <laughs> doesn't scream bear market so nope should we get into it i'm like nervous for this episode let's do it all right um there's a lot to talk about <laughs> admittedly <laughs> i'm gonna uh I, I feel like i'm gonna say some things that you don't like uh this time around first one uh i don't know if you have you been following this daniel sesta stuff and uh, um uh, michael petrine who uh you know on on twitter is just sifu co-founder quadriga you've been following this I was catching up to it. Or I have, yeah. I've been paying attention. It's like watching. I mean, I don't watch a lot of TV, but you know, crypto Twitter sometimes provides free entertainment and a good one of that. And this is just uh, this is pr- this is prime time. CSI Miami is over. CSI Crypto Twitter is back. Um, here's the here's the thought here. So actually, let me provide some context. So there's some stuff coming out of um, uh, of Twitter. There's a, a couple of great folks who've been doing some research. Um, the kind of one line takeaway is that there's this guy, 0x Sifu, um, who is the CFO of Wonderland. And there's some uh, revelations uh, that he is that that is actually Michael Petrin, who is the co founder of Quadriga CX. I'm going to give a little bit of detail here. This, in my, my take, is this is seeming pretty bad, but also you don't want to jump to conclusions. We don't have all the info. I'm just going to lay out the facts and we can discuss. So for those who are unfamiliar with Quadriga, uh, it's the Canadian exchange that collapsed in 2019 after the founder, Gerald Cotton, uh, basically disappeared. Um, I think supposedly he died with his body cremated before anyone had a chance to verify his death. Pretty pretty sketchy, right? It was in India. I think there was someone said that he died of irritable bowel syndrome, which doesn't really happen. Anyways, 169 bucks, 169 million just kind of poofed, right? And it was the biggest uh, exchange in Canada at the time. And uh, people back then came after Michael Patrine, who was the other co-founder of Quadriga because of his past as a scammer, right? He's this convicted felon from the U.S. who moved to Canada, changed his name. His name used to be Omar Dahani. Then it was uh, Michael Patrine. Uh, and basically, Canadians back then figured out that uh, Patrine slash Omar, his old name, uh, or now on Twitter known as Sifu, had more ownership of the hacked exchange than this dead founder, right? So they really, like, they essentially ran this Ponzi with the exchange after most people, nearly everyone lost their funds and couldn't withdraw. Uh, the founder kind of strangely disappeared uh, and supposedly died, taking all of the blame 
with his death. Uh, but, but actually, strangely enough, Omar and his wife ended up with the majority of the assets from the exchange, while again, most of the users lost all their money. So, okay, so a little tough to know where to start on this one. Again, don't have all of the facts. A lot of this is coming from crypto Twitter, but it's pretty wild to think that Omar slash Michael Patrine slash now this Twitter account, CFO of Frog, you know, Safu has been running the treasury of Frog Nation with this like long and extensive history with Ponzi's, frauds, scams. The guy even had plastic surgery to change his face, right? Uh, he's got this history of money laundering. Um, and then what happened is Daniel Sesta, who's obviously the kind of like the leader of Frog Nation, who we've talked a lot about. And I've, you know, previously I've said like a lot of respect for the guy. And again, this is really where I don't want to overstep because I don't know the full story. We don't have all the facts, but Daniel Sesta is kind of coming out and, and backing this guy and, and, and kind of saying, look, I still have respect for him. He's my partner. I've gotten to know him really well. Uh, and then that's where this extends out and the rabbit hole goes a little deeper, right? So now if you think that Daniel Sesta is involved with Safu and Michael Patrine, Sesta is associated with Wonderland, obviously, like Time, Abracadabra, Popsicle Finance. Uh, he recently had a proposal. There was a proposal to take over leadership of Sushi, uh, and that went through, right? This thing goes deep. This thing goes really deep. Um, what are your thoughts on what's going on here, Santi? And what is, I don't know if you are in any super secret special group chats uh, where there's some in info that I didn't talk about, but uh, what, what more can you share here? Well, um, all I can say is, uh, so I, it's consistent with what I've learned, which, which you just went through. And, and um, you know, there's been a lot of really good forensics. Look, on-chain data speaks for itself, right? Um, and so I would encourage people to kind of read through this, uh, the, these kind of forensic work. Here's my only, my only comment on this stuff. Why even partner with someone like this? Like I, th there was screenshots of someone going to Danielle and saying, Hey, are you aware of, of who you're partnering with? This kind of goes by this alias. And then he says like, yes. And, and then he's like, but I, I've gotten to know him as a person. And look at the end of the day, like. I just, I just think it's a lapse in character and judgment, uh, partnering with someone like that and, and holding ground. I mean, I think he's, he's not he, assuming that he just learned recently about his true kind of identity and what have you, which I find hard to believe. Um, why, why expose a project like that? I mean, and why let him manage sort of the treasury? I think, you know, like I'm a big believer people can change, but when you have a repeated history of doing this type of stuff and especially the severity by which he's done it, just walk away. Just it's 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 crypt, it's it's radioactive material, and so in crypto and just generally, you want to move really fast when you sense danger. <laughs> it's what I've learned. Uh, it's sort of you never want to be the Talib Turkey, right? Which is everything's fine. Or like a frog. Let's use a better analogy: a frog in boiling water. That 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 is my comment to all of this. Is if you're here and you're interacting with these protocols, everything that has been touched by by these folks don't be the frog in boiling water that says no look the water's kind of kind of a little bit warm and getting a little bit warmer and getting a little bit warmer because at one point it will be boiling and you will be toast just don't be that person in crypto you always want to optimize for survival play the long game and walk away and so i i'm very i'm very harsh when it comes to these things i just learn to walk away when the, you smell that things are not right there's no point of of entertaining and, and risking, uh, if you have funds in these protocols, I, I, you know, just yank them and move, walk away. Right. Yeah. I, I completely agree with you. And like Danny Sesta, again, Danny, I don't know, Danny, if you're listening to this, we'd, we'd love to have you on the podcast to chat about this, honestly, open invite, I'd say. Um, but yeah, you're right. He, I mean, he kind of did double down, right? He tweeted out today, allegations about our team member, Safu will circulate. I want everyone to know that I was aware of this and decided that the past of an individual doesn't determine their future. I choose to value the time we spent together without knowing his past more than anything. Okay. You could say that's nice, but as one Twitter user commented, in 2005, he pled guilty to credit and bank fraud. In 2007, he admitted burglary, theft, and computer fraud. 2018, he and his partner, quote unquote, lost access to nearly 150 million in customer funds. I agree that inmates deserve second chances, but this is not about being convicted, right? So this is a really interesting thing. I think one of the most interesting points is what you bring up, which is that things that he touches are now getting hurt right? The price of sushi, which Danny says is now, I guess, taken over. I don't fully understand the whole sushi debacle. Sushi is down to like four bucks now, right? Sushi is down to $4.10. For $4, yeah, which is the lowest it's been in a long time. 
so so it's sushi um it's 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 time it's it's even mim it's it's really everything right uh, it's abracadabra it's wonderland's it's popsicle finance everything that he's kind of touched is you've now got this like element of uncertainty around it which really what are these things except for just trusted systems uh and i think the yeah. you know maybe we should have known right maybe we should have known we've been saying like oh there are these crypto ponzi's right it's like DeFi 2.0 it's just you know we almost laugh that they're like these ponzi's right but they're like we, we always say that they're these like ponzi's that work really well but maybe the ponzi's are just ponzi's uh, yeah I, I think there's it's important to um a couple more points here one look i'm a big proponent and i do believe that and on like this there are anonymous entities and individuals groups satoshi right um and it's important i I believe in it i think i don't want this to be overblown and saying look an on culture is dead because there are really good individuals out there that i know on a personal basis in person and i met they just maintain an anonymous ident you know an anonymous kind of profile for a variety of reasons. And I, I think that, but it is important, right? Uh, a healthy level of skepticism, whether it's an anonymous person or not, I think as a community, we always need to be vigilant about, you know, there's always like everything in the gold rush in any industry that is growing, you're going to attract scammers. This is not inherent to crypto. So let's just not forget that, right? Because a lot of people outside in are, are going to look at this and say, this is like the wild west. This is why I don't get involved. The crypto continues to be this wild west. The reality is, I think, I'll push back on that and say, well, you just learn about it because it's a very transparent industry. And so most people can't get away with this stuff. You know, most of the hacks, most of the people that decide to do the wrong thing, criminal activity in crypto get caught because it's a very transparent system. Um, it's not perfect, but it's more it's more transparent than other systems, right? If you ha- are involved in a hack and you try to withdraw that, you remember like the sushi, the, the master chef, the Nomi chef, like kind of rug pulling, if you will, and abandoning the project. Like he, he, he came back because <laughs> very quickly he realized it's really difficult to get away with this stuff in a transparent system like crypto. So it's important to like, with all this drama, look, we, we, we learn from these events I think we could have, I think it was Tay from uh, my crypto that said, wow, is it, it was all there. For, you could have, you could have seen the on-chain activity to understand that this guy, he goes by Sifus or something like this, yeah, um, was interacting with the same wall that she attacked way back during the Quadriga event. And so, um, yeah, you know, I think, uh, but, but I do want to emphasize this point, which is, you know, the, these episodes happen, you learn about them perhaps more so than in, in other industries that are not as transparent. Uh, and this is this is what you get when, when you see kind of a perfectly transparent system. But still, it, it is shocking, to be fair. The lesson is that it is shocking, to be fair, that we, we didn't catch up, up to this earlier. But, you know. Yeah, I mean, Tay had tagged his wallet in mid-2019, right? Shout out, Tay. Um, you know, I think so. Mike and I were talking a lot about this actually yesterday, which is that crypto is not a perfect system. It's just kind of a better system. And really, like, what determines better? And it, whoever, when, when you say like something is better, right, you kind of have to go back to like what you are trying to optimize for. And so when I think about crypto as a system in this sense, there are different things that you optimize for outside of the traditional capital market system. So one thing that you optimize for is like anyone in the world can can interact with these things. So one thing that allows you to do is like anyone in the world can go build these protocols and these apps and these games and stuff like that. And that's awesome. It leads to all this innovation. But the downside is that, yeah, there's no KYC AML. So folks like, you know, this guy, Michael Patrine, who used to be Omar Dahani, like sure as hell, he could not, I mean, he could not start a, you know, a, something like this in the traditional capital markets because he's a felon right um and so there but you're but but like that's not bad because it's just a trade-off and then the next part of this is the i think we will continue to see things like this forever right because that but like it but that doesn't matter that's fine i think what we have to get better at as an industry is understanding that like is taking advantage of the fact that this is a completely transparent system so i mean if you look at people are like kind of freaking out about this to me that's uh This is a really good example of like this open, transparent financial system, right? This could have gone on for 10 to 20 years in TradFi and people say that's absurd. Well, if you think that's, that that's absurd, go look at Bernie Madoff who literally did run a massive Ponzi scheme for two decades, right? Yeah, exactly. 
like the, the, the point that you bring up is a really good one, which is <clears throat> something that I, I think needs to be optimized for in crypto. A big area of opportunity is building a better reputation system. Whether you're anonymous or not, I think the ability, so the same way that people are staking their assets for these proof of stake systems in order to validate, and you have a validator has a reputation because everything's on chain, your uptime, these are metrics that you look at if you're staking your assets with someone. Well, in a similar manner, like I feel that um, there is this possibility and there are a lot of projects building on on-chain reputation, meaning like the actual person, right? And Project so you don't Galaxy. necessarily even know who the person is, but exactly. And so I think with NFTs, you can construct an identity where you know me, Jason, you know the kind of work that I do. We've worked together. You, you vouch for me in that context. And you have skin in the game. If I do something wrong, you're on the hook too. And so these are ways that we can create communities and scale them out and create a better reputation system to, to mitigate these type of things, right? Um, because you're absolutely right. In the real world, if this individual wanted to manage funds, he would have never been able to do that because regulatory agencies like the SEC and FINRA, and FINRA I forget which ones exactly or in Canada, but but it wouldn't have been possible given the level of disclosures. Like it, it, they ask these type of questions, right? Uh, but there are ways around that in crypto. We just we're just early, and I think we, we you know that is the the positive spin to all of this is that now I think more focus should be put on. Maybe perhaps for any identi- for any person working on these projects, well, it'd be nice to have kind of a reputation system where people can vouch. Projects vouching for other projects and founders, whether you're not or not, and you don't want to. Do- I'm not. I'm not. I'm not suggesting we should all dox ourselves. I'm not. I'm not going there. I'm just saying staking your reputation and and staking you, you know, and, and vouching for the quality of work for others um, in a way that has skin in the game and, and, and consequences. All right, so here, 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 last take on this and then we can move on. This is an example. It seems like we are in a bear market, which is not a bad thing. Everyone freaks out when I say this. I think we're starting to be in a bit of a bear market, but with a shallow bottom that will recover quickly, right? I think people in crypto are really mm. scarred and you say bear market and they cover their ears and they hide under their desk and they say, no, 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 the two year bear market, I'm freaking out. No, 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 there are other such things as bear markets. Uh, when you look at market cycles, especially in the last three, four, five, six years, uh, cycles have accelerated basically over time. Uh, and especially with the Fed coming in in March, 2020, that basically accelerated cycles. So like, if you look at the March, 2020 bottom, even, even in equities, like that lasted for like three days, right? The bottom was in for like three days and then we came back up. And the reason is, be- is because the Fed stepped in. And so I think when you look at bear markets, like it doesn't have to have this long drawn out 18 month, 24 month bear market where the thing slides down 80%. But it, but I will say, there are some characteristics of bear markets that I'm starting to see. A, just sentiment on crypto Twitter feels very bearish. B, the amount of money coming into the space is not doing anything to prop this stuff up. We'll talk about fundraises in a second, but the prices are still sliding. And then C, most importantly, the most characteristic thing of bear markets is that things start to unravel, right? When I look at things unraveling, I'm looking when I when I look at this whole frog stuff and Daniel Sesta and like and uh, and whatever Michael Patrine, this is this is an unraveling of a project, right? Those kind of things don't happen when prices are up only. Another one, I mean, we can talk about Solana as well. Like, there's some stuff going on with Solana uh, that's like not horrible, but like the Solana congestion is kind of a bit of a disaster, and right, uh, and and we can talk about that if you if 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 you disagree there, but like that's an unraveling that happens in a bear market. Uh, there, I mean, the the list kind of goes on. Like the the curve wars are starting to unravel a little bit as people are mass withdrawing MIM out of the curve pools. Like that's an unraveling that you see in a bear market. Um, and so that is my biggest takeaway of all of this. Yeah, like look, I don't. Uh, the first two points I definitely agree with. The, the the third one of the unraveling, I I sort of think like to be fair, like something like Solana is is sort of well, it's just it's growing pains of of of, of adoption. <clears throat> now, like it's not going to be a smooth up only, right? You have these sequential kind of waves of adoption, and I almost think that they look like sinusoidal curves, like you know you have like these sequential curves, right? And at moments it does feel like things slow down. It does feel like, you know, the user experience get degraded in Ethereum, it gets degraded in Solana because it gets a lot of traction, projects deploy in there and things get congested. I, I actually don't think that that is characteristic of a bear market. Maybe perhaps the focus on it is, but 
I actually think that's a, if anything, that's a, that's a, that's a bullish signal where, you know, things get adopted, things get adoption, things break. Right. And, and I think that continues to be a, pro- a problem in crypto, but it, one that is inherent of other industries as well. Um, so, uh, but yeah, are we on a bear market or not? I mean, I, I sort of feel that, my response to all this is like, I don't necessarily care, to be honest. It is, I think that you would have looked at technology over the last 10 years. And are we, like, crypto is a little bit tricky because it is very volatile. And you've never had an asset class that has this amount of uh, li- liquidity to attach to early, early stuff. Like, the, there's a reason kind of why, like, venture is a great asset class because as a venture capitalist, you invest in stuff and you wait 10 years until you have some liquidity event, whether it's the company is acquired or it IPOs. And it's, it's a fantastic, you sleep well at night. Crypto is different because you have early, everything I think is super early stage. But there is also this desire to get reasonable price discovery. We don't even have valuation methodologies attached to any of this. I mean, it took over an entire century to like Benjamin Graham valuation methodologies to come to what we now think of EBITDA ratios and P ratios and cash flow metrics to traditional equities and markets. And crypto is different. We're trying to like attach some of these valuation frameworks, but it's quite, quite different. And so all of this is going on and it's chaotic, right? And so I think it's really hard to look at something and say, yeah, for all intents and purposes, you are in a correction territory. The Nasdaq's down 10% of T's, but okay, that is correction. Technically, I understand that. But, you know, price to me is not the leading indicator. Um, it is it is one metric for sure. And it's important because it fuels a lot of things in DeFi specifically and, and speculation. But the number of developers, the number of private funding, the level of interest, um, especially across NFTs and gaming. And I, all of that to me, like I feel calmer now than perhaps I felt in 2018 for, for one very clear, per, for one specific reason, which is crypto for the first time is entering this stage of delivering useful applications. And I think that is much, much different than any other moment in this industry. And I continue to think that we're reaching or are at that point in real time of the same that email did to the internet. Before that, most people didn't understand why you'd use this technology, mostly used by academics, pictures of cats being uploaded. Funny enough, these things also are happening in crypto. For a long time, people looked at this industry and said, it's just a bunch of speculation and I don't understand the whole reason of this industry. People are just gambling and yeah, it's a casino, fine, I get it. It never closes, it's enticing. But but that's not true because a lot of people are coming to this space and using applications and playing games and collecting NFTs. And and I think that to me is the most bullish thing that is is happening and has been happening over the last year in earnest. And I think this year, even more so, like I don't see that slowing down, Jason. I, I don't know about you, but in everything that I talk to, people that are outside of crypto, there's a lot of interest. Can we go down from here another 60%? Absolutely. Like, I think markets are irrational, not just in crypto. Like, markets in general stop being rational since QE. You know what I mean? Like, you've been in this pond, in this free monetary environment and the music and, like, Howard Marks is being bearish for the last 10 years, but then he finally says, look, I just got to dance because I need to allocate money. And this is just the state of the world that we're in. That's That does concern me, candidly. This This sort of, like increasing like dependence on on debt and it, it, across the board i mean it does worry me but i also think that look the only thing that really gets you out of any trouble historically has been innovation and has been technology and i think that the most exciting thing happening you could argue is crypto like that is touching so many different industries now i biotech might be the second one like stuff like crispr and gene editing and that stuff is really interesting that aside i think the most exciting thing on the innovation front, first or second is Web3, generally, because it's disrupting so many different industries, creating so many different business models and touching everyone in the world because we are now all connected. And so I'm, I, I know I'm always painting a super bullish case. I appreciate that I'm wearing a bear sweater, but I, I think like that's my response to all this. Like I, I feel I feel really excited about this industry. It's hard not to. Like, and so like if, if price continues to go down, great, I'll bid. I'll hit the bid all day long. 
All right, friends, quick break to share some exciting updates from Avalanche, one of the leading L1s. First, the Particle NFT sale powered by Avalanche. Particle has fractionalized high-end art into 10,000 NFTs, the first piece being Banksy's. Love is in the air. Check it out, particlecollection.com. Number two, an ILO, initial litigation offering, has started on Avalanche in partnership with Rival, Rival with a Y, a community fundraising platform for court cases. Really interesting use case there. Uh, number three, enterprise partnerships growing on Avalanche. Deloitte recently partnered with them to optimize logistics around natural disaster relief and claims payouts. MasterCard also tapped them to help accelerate crypto startups. Uh, number four, last but not least, I got an early look at a report from the Crypto Carbon Ratings Institute that shows the energy usage of various L1s. Avalanche came out very low in terms of total energy usage relative to other L1s. Thank you, Avalanche. Big thanks for sponsoring Empire. Now, let's get back to the show. Okay, so here's my, I have two takes, one agree and one disagree. You and me are eternal optimists, right? You and me are eternal optimists who love crypto and believe in this space, right? I will work, I mean, I like I there's no there's no plan B for me right like I'm working in crypto for the rest of my life right I and I think that I think that'll almost sound one day like I'm working in the internet yeah no shit you are everything touches the internet so I agree with you on all of that where I disagree is that I think it's important to try to decide if we're going lower or not I'm not a trader but I still try to decide if we're going lower or not lower and still try to think about what a bear market could look like because things do unravel. And like one other thing about unraveling. So maybe Solana was a bad example, right? The Solana congestion, you can almost argue actually that's a factor of a bull, of a bull market, right? Not a not a bear market is congestion. But like Anchor, right? Anchor on a, on Terra. Like Anchor is like lend and borrow platform. Anchor's got only like so so background on Anchor for those who don't know. Anchor makes money in two ways, right? You can post bonded collateral and then they take that collateral and they stake it or they charge borrowers APR on outstanding loans. Um What's been happening, again, this is a factor of like not an up only market is when you go to the, the dashboard on Anchor, you can see this huge divergence in the amount of people depositing to earn this fixed 20%, which has now been cut down to like fixed 12 to 15% uh, and the amount of people borrowing, borrowing, right? And as people deposit to earn that like 12 to 15%, that's more of a liability that Anchor has to pay out. But now they're not generating as much revenue anymore because down market to keep up with the demand on the borrow side. So you ha- so now Anchor's forced to dip into the treasury. So what's happening now is the treasury has started drying up, right? And Anchor has like 30 or f- I think it's like $40 million left in the, in the treasury that is a 30 day runway, my friend. And that is a, that is a scary thing. And so while I don't th- now, now that'll be solved by the way, there's not, I don't want to cause a bunch of FUD like LF, like that'll be solved. Right. I think Do Kwan and like, I think the TFL wallet moved into the LFG wallet, like 50 million Luna. That's like 3 billion. They'll probably put like a hundred or 200 or 300 million of UST into the anchor reserve. Again, I don't want to cause a bunch of FUD. I just think it's important to look at like things do blow up when, when markets go down and like uh, Bernie Madoff, right? Bernie Madoff could have run that thing for another 20 years. Uh, if the 2007, 2008 recession didn't happen, the only reason he got caught is because the 2007, 2008 recession blew up the whole plan, but in an up only market Ponzi's and, and other like not, not really complete systems work. So that, that, I think that's my argument. Yeah. <clears throat> Look, I, there's always going to be scams. There will always be, pockets within crypto increasingly so because as we talked a lot about how crypto is becoming more of a pretty a pretty expansive industry universe of applications touching many different industries that behave differently nfts behave much will and increasingly will behave much differently than bitcoin markets and DeFi. um it's there is still correlation for sure but Increasingly, so I think that correlation will loosen as you're like the user that's coming to NFTs is is different um, than perhaps the one that is touching DeFi. And look, it's still relatively early to the point there. Historically, there's been the same market participants in the 2017 crash. It was just the same people, you know, recycling capital. And it's sort of that that musical chair is going to stop, right? And it unwound and then unraveled in a very drastic way. As it's collapsed 90%, 80%. But now I think you have a healthy 
we should track this and, and post stuff, but you know, anyone out there that wants to collaborate would be great. The, 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 the diversity of the, of the user, user base in crypto, I think is, is increasing pretty dramatically. And especially last year with people NFT. The question is, what are those people actually going to do? Those people that are coming to NFTs, are they migrating to and experimenting in other fields like DeFi and gaming and, and other spaces? And so as we continue to see that, I think that is sort of the bullish case, the optimist case in all of this, which is you're just attracting a whole different set of, of cohorts that think differently, that behave differently, that have different interests. Um, and I think ultimately like creates a, a much more healthy market. Uh, I'm not suggesting it's up only, but I am suggesting that you're still, it, this is very much a secular trend. And so, yeah, there will be ebbs and flows for sure. But that I also, it's, it's a lot of noise because again, you go back to this idea that some of these markets are trying to approximate some price discovery, but I think it's going to take years to get some reasonable price discovery on any of this stuff. Bitcoin's just slightly farther, farthest along, but still, you know, people are still, the, the thing is like, as you've said in one episode very eloquently, none of this industry has like one CMO. There's no like one marketing department for crypto that says, this is the narrative, this is the meme, let's go. Everyone collectively is sort of chaotically kind of like, you know, trying to come up with different narratives and they all move very quickly. And sometimes it's not very cohesive uh, and it's chaotic for sure. And so that adds another layer of complexity, which I don't think is bad. I think it's actually good in the long term, but it's still, it's still, you know, um, another variable that can add more noise to this equation. Santi, I don't know if you've ever taken a uh, the Myers Briggs test, but you would be an ENFP, which is commonly referred to as the optimist, my friend. Uh, let's. <laughs> it's hard not to. I love it. Let's get into, um, I think something that was kind of quiet just be, uh, this week because there's so much other stuff going on is actually a bill. I find regulation dreadfully boring because just like you, I am an optimist and I think things will get sorted out and worked through, but there's actually a bill this week that I found pretty, uh, pretty absurd that I think is important to talk about. Big shout out to Jerry Brito, uh, and the team over at coin center, who's just helped. I think a lot of the industry think through this bill. And I think uh, just in general has done like such amazing work. And so some, some of the info here that I'm going to share is pulled from Coin Center. Uh, there's a new bill that would hand Treasury basically a blank check to ban crypto at exchanges. And it's really not just crypto, actually. There's this provision in provision in the America Competes Act would allow Treasury to secretly prohibit any kind of transaction it deems a concern without any public notice or input. Again, that's not just scary for crypto. That's that's scary for uh, that's scary for our uh, just privacy, right? And so the so-called uh, special measures provision, which is proposed by uh, Jim Himes, would essentially give the Treasury Secretary unchecked and, un uh, and unilateral power to ban exchanges and other financial institutions from engaging in crypto transactions. So how do they do this? Uh, it's, it goes back to the Bank Secrecy Act, which we talk about a lot. Uh, the Bank Secrecy Act basically allows the secretary to identify a primary money laundering concern and take, quote unquote, special measures to A, require financial institutions to report information on the concern and B, prohibit uh, financial institutions from maintaining accounts related to the concern. I'm going to tie this back to Uniswap in a second, which is really interesting. The new provision does three things. One, it adds certain transmittal of funds to the list of things that can be banned by the secretary. Two, it eliminates all public notice and comment requirements. And three, eliminates the 120 day limitation for measures imposed without regulation. Concluding thing, I know I'm droning on here about regulation. If adopted into law, what this does is this provision would be a disaster. Uh, honestly, a disaster, not just for crypto, but for privacy, right? And democratic public processes related to basically all financial transactions. And the reason I found this so important is this was a completely crazy exchange on Twitter that happened. Uh, Hayden Adams of Uniswap tweeted out this week, JP Morgan Chase closed my bank accounts with no notice and no explanation. I know many individuals and companies who have been similarly targeted simply for working in the crypto industry. And Brian Kintens, right, formerly, I think, commissioner of the CFTC tweets out, 
This is likely a shadow debanking of crypto by the Federal Reserve or USOCC bank examiners with direction from the top. If the examiner told a bank that a certain customer is too risky and the bank ended that relationship, the bank is contractually prevented from telling that customer why. This also happened to Peter McCormick about a year ago. There are many, many, many examples of friends, uh, that, some of my friends in crypto where this happens to them. This is, this is not good, my friend. This is not good. Well, you know who's behind that? It's a big bank lobbyists that uh, have a lot of muscle and resources. Um, yeah, no, not not ideal. A, a lot of times these bills, uh, you know, get proposed and they're, they're, they're good to at least like introduce awareness and, and discussion. Um, but, you know, a lot of times you see like a particular um, a particular congressman or member of this proposed a type of bill that is heavily backed by like, you know, bank lobbyists and, and what have you. Uh, and so, uh, yeah, obviously there'd be a discussion period and, and, you know, this is not going into effect. It's important to like, you know, recognize that it is alarming, of course, if it goes through as intended, but a lot of times they get, you know, modified or not, don't even go through. Um, but yeah, no, not ideal. Um, there is actually, um, uh, it will probably come out today, but the bright side of all, of all on, a, on the regulatory front, at least is, <clears throat> I was catching up with a good friend yesterday, Evan, who is at um, uh, Bison Trails, now Coinbase. And Evan and I go way back. We, when we were running validator nodes and staking operation, we went and tried to uh, propose a specific uh, guidance on the taxing side of how to treat staking rewards um, as for ordinary income or capital gains. And I think, I think uh, we had a very favorable outcome, um, which we'll link hopefully in the show notes. I'll tweet about it. Um, I'm waiting for the final kind of like dossier if you will like you know but it's essentially like very very favorable for the staking industry which means you know that touches ethereum tezos like every single proof of stake network and, and how it gets treated in the u.s by the irs which would obviously increase the participation rate of staking and, you know obviously a big part of why you wouldn't want to stake your assets if, if, if the tax code is uncertain or if it's too cumbersome well you, it's sort of a, a death you know it deters you from doing that but i think that was a big impetus this started mind you Three years ago, Evan and I kind of went to Treasury, went to and, and, and engaged a whole set of uh, people that were much more knowledgeable than us to make the case to treat staking rewards in a very favorable manner for uh, U.S. citizens. And so that that hopefully comes out. Uh, we'll link to, uh, you know, if it comes out, we'll link it in, in the show notes. But keep an eye out for that because that's super favorable uh, for, for crypto. Awesome. Nicely done, sir. Thank you. Yeah. Even though I'm not American... I, when I used to be there, I, I engaged a lot with uh, members of Congress and Senate and just try to educate them. Uh, my yep. view is always that regulators do want to listen. You just have to you know, spend the time and, and help them understand why this technology is so powerful. Um, I'm going to actually stop talking about the markets in a second because uh, I know you want to get into some fundraising and just other exciting things, NFTs, optimistic things, as we would call it. This is the optimistic episode. Um, Matt Hogan did have a good tweet, though, which he said, I'm surprised more people in crypto aren't talking about Q4 of 2018. Thought it was an interesting analogy. Q4 of 2018 is the last time the Fed raised rates. Bitcoin fell 44% that quarter, right? The last time the Fed raised rates, Bitcoin fell 44% in a quarter, right? Uh, for what it's worth before entering a multi-year bull market, okay? So I think there's something to be said for, I mean, shout out Matt Hogan, one of the goats in our industry. He, you know, I think it's a good analogy, right? The Fed talks about raising rates or raised rates. Bitcoin falls 44% and then we enter a multi-year bull market. Um, and I think that it's important to, like you've been saying, to just zoom out and say, look, do you believe in this space over the next five to 10 years? If so, stay allocated, continue allocating dollar cost average in. And if you don't believe in it and you're just here for the uh, NFT your friend sent you, I mean, probably not a good place for you to be. That's actually really interesting. It's important. I mean, I don't want to get too much into, I don't know if people kind of truly understand like when you raise rates, it the discount rate goes up, therefore the value, the valuation of these companies goes down. So, so yeah, essentially like the way you, if you think about how to value a company, a lot of times it's the ex, a lot of it is the present value of the company. Some of it, a lot, a lot of it is what is the future expectation of growth of that company and cash flows it will generate. Right. And you're paying some sort of multiple on expectations of growth into the future of a particular company. And you either measure that as cash flows and then, all those cash flows you you have you take the net present value of that meaning you take a discount rate 
based on a number of things. One of them is the risk-free rate, which is the 10-year treasury, because you know the U.S. and the government is the risk, the riskiest thing, right? You can buy a bond, a treasury. And so people look at treasuries because that is factors into your cap and model or the way you kind of construct this discounted, the, this discount rate, which is any market participant always has the opportunity cost of doing what? You can always invest in an instrument like a treasury, which is super safe, or you can invest in other things like bonds, which are reasonably safe, and then equities, which have much more you know, risk attached to them. And so you know, when rates go up, then inherently when you're taking a higher when the rate goes up then the, the 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 present value of that company goes down it's ceteris paribus meaning and it was all things unchanged as the discount rate goes up the value of that stream of cash flows in perpetuity over a certain period of time that you're thinking in the future expectation are worth less right and so inherently when you take all of that then the value of that company goes down and so that that causes a reset obviously in market participants uh, I think a lot of what is happening is I think people were just caught off guard with how the, the Fed was going to, how quickly they were going to move. I think the Fed grossly underestimated like inflation and some of these things, right? I don't think a lot of people perhaps anticipated another wave of COVID. We were kind of up and, and things were looking pretty good until Omicron. And so anyways, all of this to say is it's interesting like how this phenomenon, maybe, maybe what this says is, okay, maybe you see a reset. Extending this, if, if this were happening, happen, I'm probably be saying is, okay, the discount, the, the rates go up. People already factor that into their models. But the reality is most market participants, if you look at March, right, when COVID first hit, I think it was Ackman or, or one guy, and I read one, it was a really interesting podcast where he said, look, okay, fine. You have these moments in the market where there's a big dislocation, where market participants are caught off guard. When, when people in the market are, are caught off guard, it causes this reset in valuation, expectation, discount rate, all this stuff, and, and the riskiness of, you know, whatever. And it's a reset, and then it's like, People might go to cash in the global financial crisis. If you remember, everyone went to cash because it's like, I just need time to figure out if I'm going to be, you know, if I'm going to survive in COVID. Similarly, people need go to cash in these brief moments to figure out what they're going to do next, but they hate sitting in cash. You never sit in cash, right? Because you get paid to allocate and there's a high opportunity cost because, because especially when there's inflation, you need to beat that inflation rate, right? And so my expectation is, okay, fine. Like, okay, you want to reset? You want to buy time? You're going to go to cash because you're panicking? Fine. Okay. I think a lot of people already did that for what it's worth, hedged. Um, and so then the question is, you're going to look at how am I going to beat inflation of 6% or 4%? I don't know. Uh, maybe pick the industry that has grown the fastest and is going to produce the best risk-adjusted returns. Uh, I, uh, well, over the last 10 years, I think you've realized at this point now that having some allocation of crypto is sensible because it produces really interesting sharp ratio dynamics and it, it, it construct portfolio construction that's very much unchanged right and so if you still need to beat inflation then you know it's still you're still going to want to allocate to growth i don't know that's just my thinking a lot of people could disagree with this i'm not a macro expert i don't pontificate as a macro expert but anyways. a month and a half ago you told us that you sold all of your bitcoin and moved a decent chunk into eth um what percent are you allocated to cash right now cash or cash and or stables or, or you can bucket those into two different things if you see them as fundamentally different. I always like to have cash on hand to buy panic and when people are puking. So before, I, I certainly drew from cash recently to, to kind of take it, you know, to buy uh, more ETH um, and other assets that I like um, in my short list. Um, but roughly speaking, it's probably like 10, 12% in cash, maybe a little bit more. I just literally have it on reserve and I'm, I get paid. A, like, this is a nice thing, which is makes the argument of why these, these dips get bought a lot of times in 2017, you didn't have the possibility. Like if you wanted to hedge or have cash, you have to kind of exit the system. Now you can swap for a stable coin, deposit that stable coin, get some yield. But the velocity of that moves pretty quickly, right? Because if you have stable, you're earning the yield, which is pretty nice and decent, then you can quickly allocate it and buy these dips. And so I think that's what you've kind of been seeing, which is different than 2017. And I, 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 anecdotally, that's what I do. Yeah. Uh, you, you, you sent out a tweet two days ago that said, I'm bidding here. I don't try to time the markets. I just try to buy when I see indiscriminate selling and pain. Time in the market beats timing the market. I am with you. Uh, and this is the optimist. This is, again, let's just keep going back to this word, the optimist in me. Like, my bullishness actually goes up when the market crashes, which we're like, no, no shot it does. 
for me, it really does. I Maybe it's not bullishness, but it's excitedness, right? So for me, what I'm seeing right now is a $1.6 trillion industry that is going to disrupt gaming, social media, finance, money, everything that we know, I would say, will end up getting disrupted by crypto. And the industry is only $1.6 trillion, right? What's happened over the last several months is there's all these assets and all these things that I want to allocate to and, and buy, but there's, they're so kind of propped up that I get scared about moving into them. And so when market crashes, like you just said, you buy the panic. These, I, love, I love crashes because I think it's a time for people to take a step back and reassess what their portfolio looks like, figure out if they still really, really like what their portfolio looks like. And then because everything's down 30 to 50%, reallocate and move into the things that you like. So my question there, Santi, is you've got this 10 to 12% cash. You see things fall. How do you think about like how to time the market like this, how you decide how to enter, how you decide like uh, how, how you almost size bets, right? If you like ETH, which we know you do, do you move 80% into ETH or you kind of, you know, same amount of money into eight different projects? Like how do, how do you size these things and what's your framework for deciding to enter? Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of questions, so I'll, I'll try to be kind of precise in, in a lot of these things. So one, one is, I think constantly about my allocation into liquid crypto and illiquid crypto, meaning private projects. I'm very active on the age of front. I think vast majority of my portfolio, like two thirds of my portfolio is into early stage private stuff because I find the most amount of comfort there. If I see a team that is competent, hungry, innovating, has a reasonably low burn rate, Bill Ty said this in our episode, which is fantastic. And I, and I 100% agree with it. His, his mindset is that is the safest thing for me to park my capital in any, like in any, I've always been, I, I, I've always believed that that is, that is like the safest place to park. Now, not all bets are going to pan out. So when you think about construction, I'm very, I have many, many investments. I, I think thematically, I think I like this space. I like these themes. I try to develop an independent view of, of what I think needs to be built, hasn't been built. And then at that point, I just go and try to find the best operator or operators and make one or two or multiple bets in a particular category that I think is pretty nascent, has a lot of asymmetry. And one of them is going to pan out. In venture, you have these parallel returns, right? If you were early in DeFi, which were, you know, I, I was, um, it took one Ave to, to make up for any other loss you could have had in your portfolio. Or it's one synthetic being very early on DeFi. And I think I always kind of remind myself of that my job is not to be right about everything. I do need to constantly be a bat. I do need to constantly like make bets on things that perhaps other people are overlooking. And that was NFTs early, like last year at some point, you know, that was gaming when Axie started to take off. And then I made a number. So when, when Axie started to take off, for, as an example, I had an allocation of the seed round passed because it was just too small and a number of things when I was a parafine. But then I still paid attention to that. And then I, I started seeing this, like just a lot of traction there. And what did I do? I went out and invested in 20 other gaming projects, including one of them, Illubium, and a bunch of others. And so to me, it's like sometimes the best bets that I made are not the, not trying to be like the first investing in the first mover. Because sometimes I think first mover advantage in crypto is actually not really powerful because you have like the open source systems of code is easily forkable. So I often remind myself, okay, I'm not supposed to like maybe catch everything at the first shot, but pay attention. If you miss it, don't, don't kick. I try not to like obsess about why I wasn't super early in Axie. I said, wait a minute, this is just proving how big this market can be. And so I go out and make second, third bets into teams, competent teams that I think are going to go after a big category. So just in summary, I'm, Probably two thirds of my portfolio is illiquid. Always has been. I'm just comfortable with that. Which brings me to my third point, which is I always keep a decent amount of cash on reserve because what you don't want is when you have a liquidity in your portfolio, you want to have the ability to you know stay solvent, stay liquid, right? And so that's why it's important to have. Perhaps my allocation of cash is is higher than particular like a fund, right? A fund probably doesn't have a lot of cash. The fourth piece I'll say is historically in crypto, there's a great analysis that I think someone put out there and this was years ago i remember seeing it which is if you're bidding th there are episodic moments across the history of bitcoin ethereum and some and just generally this market there are very singular literally days or weeks where the market really pukes and if you bid on every single one of those if you, historically it would have been a vast overperform like overperformance whether if you just remain like 
you know, you were bought early, right? And, and that's it, you didn't touch. I think the market offers you these, these opportunities to take advantage of. If you've done the work, you've done the research, you believe in this long term, it's important to stay solvent. It's important to like, you could be farming, you could be earning a steady stream of cash flow from your work or whatever, and use that in these moments where a lot of market participants are forced selling. Why? Because they get greedy. You, they use leverage, it, this, it's playing with fire, right? Because this industry will continue to be very volatile. And if you understand that psychology, you know that there are a number of market participants out there that are getting too greedy. You look at funding rates, go about 0.1, 0.15, 0.2, it, it literally is a ticking bomb. And so you just wanna be there to hit the bid when, when a vast majority of this market is gonna have to force sell. And that's what I look at. I don't try to time the market, but when I see people force selling, assets that they like and i know they like and i'm talking to a lot of a, a lot of guys and it's like why are you selling this i'm i, I know their wallet it's like why are you selling it well because i'm gonna get liquidated otherwise and i say boom that's when i hit the bid and my job now is to constantly talk to these people when i see this market activity i'm on the phone with two or three or ten different funds or mark and or other you know and understand what they're doing and this week i saw a lot of that and so i said okay this i go for long walks because that's where i get my best ideas uh, and I was like, okay, it feels to me like even the people that don't, that want to hold are selling to cover their margin call. And that's why I keep some cash in reserve always. Yeah. Always. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you you have to know that there's always going to be these mega liquidation candles, you know? A hundred percent. There will always be four sellers because this industry, people want to get greedy and uh, using a lot of leverage. And I always like to remind people, look, play the long game. The number one thing you want to optimize for here is, and I hate to see it. When you're right on your thesis, but somehow you express that view in a way that is really not going, not setting you up for success. Why play with leverage? You're going to get liquidated. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I don't know if you read Howard Marks's recent piece on, uh, on selling, mm -hmm. but he had this line. Mm -hmm. It was like, when you look at a chart for something that's gone up and to the right for 20 years, think about all the times a holder would have had to convince himself or herself not to sell, right? Everyone wishes they bought Amazon at $5 on the first day of trading in 1998, since it's up 660X at like 3,500 bucks or 3,000 bucks, whatever it's at today. But who would have continued to hold when the stock hit $85 in 1999, up 17X in less than two years? You think you would have continued holding after it's up 17X? Or how about on the downside, right? Who among those would have held after and avoided panicking in 2001 as the price fell 93% to $6. And who wouldn't have sold by late 2015 when it hit 600, up 100x, right? But anyone who sold at 600 captured only the first 18% of the overall rise from that low, right? So a lot of this game is pick your theses, pick your companies, pick your projects, pick your entrepreneurs, and just hold. And when the price goes down and folks get liquidated and there's forced selling, that's your time to double down. It's all right. I was tweeting about this in the bear market uh, where I was had more time to write. And you zoom out on these charts of Google, Amazon, and a lot of people kind of thought, as you just said, thought, I missed this. And it's important to zoom out. And, and I think, again, look at things that we've talked about in this podcast that I think give you a fresh vantage point into how things are actually being built and will ex develop. It's hard to think that like the number of developers entering these systems from top, top developers in Silicon Valley that have a huge opportunity cost. They're entering the space, they're gonna build. That probably takes two or three years to kind of really fully express itself in meaningful products. And the pace of innovation in this space continues to increase because of it's open source and so it's composable. And so that is just means faster rate of innovation. Um, and so look, I think by and large, like I totally agree with you, like, it, you know, I don't want to just say take a passive approach and just buy Bitcoin, buy Ethereum, buy some, buy the major ones. But there are ways to kind of express this. Like you can buy a composite index. A bit, you know, talk about Matt Hogan. Like I think Bitwise and uh, Grayscale. Not some of these products are not easy to access. I appreciate that. There are set protocol. There's I think a number of things that like I think it's Mark Andreessen that he get asked if you get if you get ten million as one of the best VC investors out there. I think and founders like. Yeah. He said, if you caught like $10 million right now, where would you put them? He's like, just go long the S&P 500, L literally. Because, you know, and, and I think that's, you know, coming from one of the best investors in, in, in tech, there's something there, right? And so if you buy a basket of broad-based exposure crypto that is rebalancing, rebalancing, that's a key, because the S&P rebalances, right? 
constantly. The composition of the S&P 500 has changed so much dramatically over the last 80 years, and especially over the last 20 years, right? There was no technology in the basket, like not too long ago, but now it does, right? And so maybe you didn't believe in technology, but just by virtue of being on the S&P, you would have had exposure to technology without having a, without, to your point, you may have missed Amazon specific names. And so maybe the best thing that probably, if you're not 100% like in crypto, but you believe in this, a rebalancing index to the top crypto, like by market cap is probably like, probably will outperform like 99% of the market participants out there. They're trying to get too cute. All right, let's get into some of the roundup stuff. Um, some of the news, some of the news that happened this week. Um, oh man, let's do fundraising because fundraising is fun. Uh, shout out to the graph raised uh, 50 million bucks led by Tiger. Uh, do you, how much do you know about the graph? Because as this came out, I am realizing that I am under, uh, I know I don't know enough about the graph as I should, and I see a lot of folks talking about it and a lot of projects using the graph. And like Tegan's obviously awesome. And so, can you uh, can you give us a little bit of info on the graph if you know about it? I was an early investor in it. Uh, I led the round. Uh, well, I, when I was at Parify, we we invested in the graph in an early round. What Google does for search, the graph is doing for blockchains. Meaning, like a lot of these blockchains, like Google indexes a lot of data in the web. And makes it when you search, hey, I want a hotel in whatever. It, it renders that, right? Hey, I, and so it indexes this this web, right? It unstructured data or structured data, but it's just like all over. It constantly changes. And Google just has an algorithm that, that like renders that and ind- indexes that. And, and similarly, blockchain data is very unstructured. Like it exists, right? Blockchains are data rich, but it is really hard you, Jason, or projects to like query this data. And what the graph has done is, and I'm, I'm oversimplifying here, we should get any even and Tegan in the pot, of course, is it basically structures that data and allows teams and, and if you want to query the blockchain in a very easy way. And so that's pretty powerful because when you go to a front end like Aave or Uniswap or some of these other applications, like they're using the graph to render you data, but a particular, you know, whatever data that they're rendering you, right? And that's pretty powerful, right? Especially as data continues to grow and expand. I invested in it because I remember um, as DeFi sort of was taking off, a lot of DeFi projects, like a lot of their front ends kept going down and there were days where it was going down. I was like, why, why is this happening? They're like, like I don't know the graph. Like it, they were, invariably everyone was using the graph and it was like, wow, this is super powerful kind of like layer of the stack, right? To help every all these applications being built on top to access this data. And so, um, that's kind of simplistically, I always kind of, the analogy is the graph, Google, uh, Google does for Web2, the graph does for Web3. Yeah, yeah. It, it, it almost seems, a, is it a little bit like what Nansen's trying to build, but Nansen's doing it from more of like a consumer's perspective? Kind of. I think, I don't know if Nansen's actually using the graph, to be fair. I think uh, the graph might be like a, a layer below. That. A layer below. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Okay. Um, yeah. All right, ne- next, uh, a couple big fundraisers. Uh, Consensus is raising at a $6.5 billion valuation, double uh, their last valuation. Um, honestly, shout out Joe Lubin. I That's a project that's been around for a very long time, obviously. Um, when or folks who were around for like 2017, 2018, going into 2019, kind of saw Consensus go from like 50 people to, uh, I think at their peak, they had 1,200 people. And then they laid off uh, a tremendous amount of folks. And Joe Lubin is just fighting and uh, bringing that thing back. And they, uh, I would say consensus, a lot of their spokes have actually been very successful. So shout out Joe Lubin. Nicely done there. Here's a big valuation. FTX US now valued at $8 billion after raising $400 million Series A. Uh, Important to note, FTX US is just continuing to become more of its own unit, I would say, and its own company, very separate from FTX. Um, One of our Mm -hmm. reporters talked to uh, FTX and FTX US, I think it was probably Brett over there, they're making a big, big, big push into derivatives, um, mm-hmm. which makes a lot of sense. I think the derivatives market is probably like 30 to 40 times larger in traditional markets than it is in crypto, um, or than it should mm-hmm. be in crypto. And so mm-hmm. I think there's, I think mm-hmm. FTX US is uh, doing a nice, nice move there with, you know, they acquired Ledger X as well. So that, you know, obviously FTX operates like no other. I will say the down, like the weird, the weird part of this is uh, their valuation. I think is now higher than Gemini's. Gemini's been around for several years. Crypto startup Gemini valued at over seven billion after their latest fundraise when they raised four hundred million. So they both raised four hundred million, but FTX US is valued at eight billion versus Gemini's seven billion. Um, that 
feels like either Gemini's undervalued or FTX US is overvalued, but who am I to say? Fireblocks, a big shout out to Fireblocks, Michael Shaulov and team. They are, uh, I'm really biased. They've like been a big supporter of Blockworks for quite a while, but I think their team has just done amazing. Uh, they just raised a big chunk of change, $550 million at an $8 billion valuation. They now have $45 billion uh, under custody, 600% revenue growth, eight times uh, the 8x client growth. They're now securing over 15% of daily crypto volumes. They are building a freaking global crypto infrastructure juggernaut over there. So big shout out to um, to Fireblocks. Did you guys use Fireblocks over there at uh, at Parify? Mm-hmm. We were actually like one of the early beta testers to help them like help them um, deploy and like build uh, like the way to like interact on chain and DeFi, like farming and all this stuff. Cause obviously we were super active in, in these strategies. And so, uh, yeah, no, I, I, I think it's one of the better, if not one of, if not the best kind of solution out there for, for complicated and easy kind of like secure infrastructure, infrastructure for funds. And so. Yeah. Yeah. And, and just for folks who don't know the Fireblocks business, yeah, like settlement on crypto rails for institutions can be kind of messy, right? Bitcoin block times are every 10 minutes. Uh, ETH is every like 10 to 15 seconds. I think it's 13 seconds. And this creates these big confirmation delays for institutions, right? Like if you send 10 million bucks, how do you know your counterparty has actually sent you the $10 million in like BTC back before the block is finalized? And so what Fireblocks actually did is they built their own settlement network, which allows the institutions to have this instant confirmation once transactions uh, over any blockchains, once you know, once they're signed or sent, uh, it's kind of like a SWIFT for crypto almost, which has this really, really powerful flywheel. Uh, I think the most interesting part of this, this is all a lot of this data is from James Ho um, over at Altimeter, who posted a thread on Fireblocks. One of their fastest growing new products is DeFi with 25% customer interaction or uh, customer adoption which through Fireblocks, this is interesting. I'm sure you, it sounds like you helped them kind of innovate on this stuff. We were, we were I think uh, we were one of the first. It's really cool. I mean, I institutions can interact with DeFi protocols through Fireblocks, right? Natively through Fireblocks' platform with their pre-built integrations with Aave and Compound and Curve and Uniswap. And then also through the Fireblocks DeFi API uh, or through their browser extension, which is really, really cool. Uh, Block Damon raised 207 mil at a valuation of 3.25 billion. Uh, again, led by Tiger Global. I think also Sapphire Ventures, also participation from SoftBank, um, Matrix, uh, Galaxy, I think joined the cap table as well. All right, those are, those are the fun little fundraises, the big fundraise of the week. I don't know if this is leaked. Was this leaked? Please or Dow, 69 mil? No, wait. Um... Well, it hasn't. It hasn't. Uh, the well, block you know, got this, I think. Yeah, I think they got the deck that uh, we had put together, and it, it. We're in the process. Let's just put it that way. Um, but as you know, like I was early in Pleasure Down, I'm, I'm in the board, and so um, yeah, it's it's the most iconic. Um, co- we have probably the most iconic collection, um, and and we will build a, not only the most iconic kind of internet culture collection. But just the best collection, full stop. Like that's our ambition. So uh, yeah, we're looking for good partners. Uh, but they look, um, can either can confirm I... or deny that. That's, that's <laughs> can I? Um, I have some questions about Pleaser Dow, and, and I won't ask about the about the investment. Who? How do you become a part of Pleaser Dow? Is it invite only? How much money do you need to get in? Like, can someone in our who listens to the podcast become part of Pleaser Dow, or or it's like this more exclusive? You need like a million bucks to get in, type of thing. No, it's a great question. I think the, the the it was formed when a bunch of us wanted to bid and buy the Uniswap B2 video from People Pleaser, which is one of the best kind of digitally native artists out there. And, and you know, we all kind of wanted it. And so we said, well, instead of outbidding each other, because otherwise one is going to get it, we just banded together. And initially we were like a group of 15 or so. Um and then, of course, the Snowden piece, the Tor piece. So every sequential kind of piece that we were buying, in moments like that, we needed to raise a little more money to buy the piece. Like the Snowden was much more expensive than the Tor piece. And then we bought Wu Tang and a bunch of Doge meme. And then in those moments, we we raised a little bit of more capital. The first contribution was relatively small. I mean, it was it was actually we bought People Pleasers video for like five hundred fifty thousand, I think, at the time, worth of ETH. No. Of course, I don't, it's still a lot of money, I guess. Um, but um, 
the short answer is we 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 are prioritizing obviously artists and collectors um the application it's it's been like episodic ad hoc when we're bidding on pieces and if we need more capital like we go out and do that um but look a big part of the push now is our whole mantra is and philosophy is to acquire pieces to please like literally to just to make sure that we are a safe place to buy these things that you know the pub you know with an aim towards you know having it publicly accessible right instead of the hands of a private collector right uh, and so part of our trajectory it hasn't been as easy right like flamingo down some of these other organizations are also guarded for for obvious reasons um but i think yeah we we it's not there's not like a process to join i think we we haven't inducted a member in a long time but we we are thinking about that and ways to involve the community obviously we fractionalized doge and that was a big part of like fractionalizing a piece that is in my mind one of the most iconic in our collection and make it accessible to the public we did the free Ross DAO, which was obviously supporting a lot of people believe in Ross, in Ross Ulrich, I think, or um, in helping his effort. Um, and so those are kind of experiments to involve more of the community. We obviously are very pro community. And so we want to, but it's just taking us time, like everything in crypto, like we, we, we need to get this right. And it's an important collection. And are you in it because like, this is like kind of an art collective or are you planning on like, will you end up making money from this as the value of the art goes up like what is the uh kind of goal here i guess i'd say it is a for-profit um enterprise uh, or you know dow i guess um but i'll tell you why i'm interested because i want to support and i want this to become what the medicis did in florence to support and be patrons of artists and be a, 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 a create a platform for for this exchange of knowledge and ideas expressed through art, I think we have an opportunity to do that uh, for NFTs, and that's very powerful. And I want that. I want to support artists. I want to support anyone out there that has. It's super powerful to see someone like People Pleaser and others that I excels, that are brilliant at what they do. And in the Web two world, it wouldn't have been discovered because there's gatekeepers and there's auctions and galleries and all this bullshit. Now, I think NFTs are super powerful because anyone can deploy, anyone can be discovered. Now, I want to be that place to support and commission art from these people and support them in that journey. And so that's why I like this. Because what I've appreciated, I'm not an art connoisseur by any stretch of the imagination. I just like stuff that I that I like, you know, that I, I don't plan on ever selling. Um, and it's awesome. And I think I realized that when I was bidding on the Snowden NFT, I said, and the Wiki, I bought the Wikipedia NFT. Like, talk about like, for me, okay, Wikipedia for me was so iconic. Like, and whether it's worth whatever, I just I just wanted to get it because it speaks to me. And I think what I've appreciated is the art world is is pretty interesting because it's it's a lot about it. It buys you some, you know. You, I think a lot of like folks back in the day, like you go to you go to the Met. There's a J.P. Morgan collection. There's a lot of these people like were patrons and contributor piece of culture to the world and you can go visit it in museums. And I think that's powerful, right? Uh, it, it gets you influence. I think the optimism, he says, if we do this right, we can actually have a lot of influence and in a good way to promote the values of crypto, Web3, openness, transparency, privacy, the right to privacy. Like these are the things that we bought, right? Snowden, um, the Tor Foundation piece, Wikipedia. This is promoting core values of crypto the permeate into culture. And I think that's what we want to do. And, and that's sort of like why I'm so excited. And I spent a big chunk of my time in, in Pleaser Dow. Nice. Very cool. Um, I think let's wrap it up with uh, similar art related things. One uh, narrative I think to pay attention to is just NFTs and metaverse uh, as the market kind of takes a turn down. Uh, is this going to be something that the larger enterprises and financial institutions stop talking about it because they're not actually as bought in and see it more of a marketing thing? Or will they continue uh, to go down the road of adoption, right? This week alone, Twitter NFTs launched in the profile pictures. Uh, it was announced that YouTube is branching into NFTs. You can catch that story on Blockworks. Uh, and then I think Reddit is also getting into NFTs as well. Uh, pretty quietly, I would say NBA Top Shots and uh, the NFTs of NBA Top Shots have, again, pretty quietly surged like 70 or 80% in the last 30 days. Um, not much to talk about that, at least on my timeline. Uh, and then on the metaverse side of things, 
Uh, this was a cool one. The Brooklyn Nets filed trademarks to become the first NBA team to join the metaverse. Uh, Goldman announced that the metaverse is an $8 trillion revenue opportunity. And on the Microsoft earnings call, uh, Microsoft announced that the metaverse is the next wave of the internet. Will this, if we, if the prices stay down for a little bit, what happens here? I don't know, but damn, that is pretty bullish, my friend. We asked Jason, um, you know, from Folius, a really good, and, and I, I think this is a question that I've increasingly asked more people is, do you think that if the price of these NFTs goes down, if the price of Bitcoin, Ethereum, all these different assets goes down, do you think that that slows down the awareness, the adoption phase that has been sort of on overdrive since NFT kind of mania took off? And because DeFi kind of never really attracted a lot of users, NFTs and gaming certainly has. And I don't know. Like, I, that's a metric that I'm going to be looking at. Um, look, said differently, I think the price of Salesforce and Amazon and Google collapsing or, you know, declining, if you will, 20, 30% during these moments over the last 20 years. I think people started using email and started using smartphones and and consumed it and put stress on the network and, and required CapEx into cellular towers. And, you know, I, I sort of think that we're in that stage. And so... I don't know. It'd be interesting. A lot. The, the the takeaway that I want to impress on people is I think this market is increasingly becoming less sensitive to just pure speculation, and entering a stage which is really interesting of adopt the usage because it's delivering applications that are delivering a faster, better, cheaper, ten x experience to what you do. Or sometimes you don't even have that experience. Talk about Jumbo, which is going to be a great episode launching later, probably next week, right? About just building the Web three super app in a place, places in Africa that don't have any services and you're leapfrogging all that infrastructure. And so I think that that's, let's not forget that because yeah, in 2017, I would have told you, yeah, it's all speculation. It's all, yeah, we'll build it. We need to raise all this capital, fine. And yeah, you would have seen a path, yeah, prices come down, right? In an environment people are more sensitive and rates go up, fine, perfect. But now, GameFi is not going away. NFTs are not going away. People are just realizing, they open a door, they see their closet physically. They're like I have a lot of shit. I collect a lot of shit. The digital identity. They spend more time in in the in the internet, online, because yeah, that's where you are, right? And you realize that there's a way now to differentiate online and create meaningful experiences that you own, that you actually own, whether it's NFTs or game or gaming, or just an asset that represents and speaks to you, and that's super powerful. Like like that's just we're so early, but hey. Well, I'm going to say we could be down another 40% next week and we'll still be here and we'll still be recording these. So we're not going away. Not That's going what I promised you. We're not going away. Um, all right. I've got, if you've made it this far, I've got two things to share with you. One is we've got a new speaker at Permissionless, speaking of the metaverse, JP Morgan's global head of the metaverse, Christine Moy, uh, has just joined us. And yes, JP Morgan has someone whose title is global head of the metaverse. I freaking love it. Uh, and then two, wow. Santi mentioned Jumbo, Jumbo, Jumbo. We've got an episode with uh, Jumbo CEO and uh, co-founder coming out in two weeks. Next week is Jason K. Uh, big insights into uh, China and the markets. Episodes after that, we've got Tarun and Tom Schmidt from Dragonfly. Blau talking music NFTs. Travis Kling talking about the markets. Amy Wu on gaming. Hasib Qureshi and Avichal Garg. Uh, talking about just markets, venture in general. Justin Kahn, previously founded Twitch. Kanav, CEO of Jump Jump Crypto. Jim Bianco, Jay Clayton, Kevin O'Leary. Ilya, the founder of Near, Gabby on YGG. Lee Jin and Jesse Walden on the creator economy. Oh my God. I mean, if you aren't subscribed to this podcast... Killer list. Got to hit yeah, that hit subscribe, friends. Subscribe <laughs> hit that big subscribe. <laughs> Give us a five-star right review. Here. I had to do it. I had to get Santi riled up. But actually, um, go hit it. Go, go subscribe. Give us a five-star review. All right, Santi's going to kill me if I say that one more time. Thanks for listening, guys. This has been uh, a fun episode. Leaked a little alpha. I hope you guys enjoy it. Uh, and I will see you, yeah. per usual, back on Twitter. All right, my friend. Great as always to be here. See you, see you next time. Thanks all for listening.